Good morning. Good morning. It's lovely to be here again. And uh, I'm quite impressed with the number of extra people there. Where were you last time? Oh, it was Bank Holiday Monday. That's right. So, um, lovely to be here again. Um, I think you're probably trying to catch me out because I think something's changed and I realise it's probably where this is positioned, so uh, nice try. <laughs> yeah, took a little bit of getting used to it. I thought, I don't remember it being there last time. But anyway, there we go. It's uh, lovely to see you as we come together to worship God. And despite all the horrible things, all the uncertainty, all the fears that we have at the moment in, in this world and life at the moment, we can still come to worship God the one true living God who remains constant. Whatever life throws at us, he remains there for us. And the Bible also talks about how there is nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing that can separate us from God's love. And that includes viruses. But God is still there for us. And so we come, and I hope with grateful hearts, to worship him and to receive from him. And so we begin by remembering the grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. And part of coming into God's presence is that we need to acknowledge that we are human beings and we carry something of the world in us. And so we need to prepare our hearts to still our minds, to still our hearts, so that we can hear from God when He speaks to us and also to receive from Him. And so together, let's pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. I guess we have no young people in today, so uh, what do you have? Are we going to, are we having a meeting or are you going to stay with us? I think it would be good if you stayed with us, I think you probably just might enjoy it. Um, so uh, nice to see you. So we, we remember God's word that he tells us that our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, hear O Israel, the Lord your God, our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these, and on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord have mercy. Uh, to come into God's presence and to be uh, able to receive from Him is to acknowledge that we are sinful human beings. We have marred God's image in us. And so we need to say sorry to God for our sins. But it's more than just saying sorry. It's actually about asking not only for His forgiveness, but also for His help. Because sorry can be such an easy word to use. So we need His help to help us to lead better lives, but lives that please him, and so as we go into the world and bear his image. And so let's just pause for a moment and think about all the things that have happened this week, those things that we've said, those things that we've done, which maybe in reflection we probably would, would, would regret, but equally so those things that we perhaps should have said and the things we should have done. So let's just pause for a moment and bring them before God. And so together we pray, Lord God, we have sinned against you, we have done evil in your sight, we are sorry and repent, have mercy on us according to your love, wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin, renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so may Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring you his pardon and his peace, now and forever. Amen. So uh, as we rejoice now in this 
powerful reminder of God's forgiveness for us and his help in uh, leading better lives. Let's stand and worship him in the words of the Gloria. And so together we say, Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, the Lamb of God, Almighty God and Father. We worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And our colleague for today, which is the 19th Sunday after Trinity. Not long to go for Christmas. And so we join with uh, countless other people in this country and uh, throughout the world as we say this prayer that has been uh, set for us. And so we say, O oh God, for as much as without you we are made able to please you, mostly grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So do please be seated for our readings. The first reading is written in the first chapter of the epistles to the Thessalonians. From Paul, Silas and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before God and Father, and before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. You know how he lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcome the message with the joy given to you by the Holy Spirit. And you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for a gospel reading. 
Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When the chief priests and Pharisees had heard of the parables, they realised that Jesus was speaking about them. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this time to be able to come and worship you. We thank you for the precious gift of your word, and we pray that you would uh, still our hearts and minds and help us to listen and to uh, learn from you and what you require from us. We pray this, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. Do please be seated. Thank you both, for, both of you for your readings, uh, particularly for Kathleen, a uh, very busy lady today. Uh, so thank you for your readings. It just takes a little bit of, particularly for the Gospel reading, it just, just takes a little bit of, uh, gives me a little bit of a rest in my voice. Now they say that there's nothing more certain in life than it's a terrible thing to say, death or taxes. Nobody likes paying taxes. I'm going to ask a question. There's nobody here that actually works for Lumen Review before I talk about taxes. <laughs> Stop complaining because it did happen to me once where I was preaching on a very similar passage when talking about paying taxes and it turned out that there was a lady in the uh, congregation who actually worked for the Inland Revenue. So it was all a little bit embarrassing, so I just thought I'd better just check. So, yes, there's nothing so certain in life as death and taxes. And uh, there's a lot of uh, sermons I've heard on this passage, and maybe you've heard sermons on this passage, that talk about the responsibility of Christians having to pay their tax. But of course we know that. But I think that actually misses the whole point of the passage. And inevitably, in the Gospels, particularly when Jesus has encounters with, with various people, there's always a deeper meaning that needs to be just teased out a bit. And sometimes we need to just kind of go back to the time when Jesus was on this earth and into the world where the people that were hearing him and with him were living. And so let's, let's go back to uh, old, uh, old time in, in, in Israel. And we're there with Jesus, walking along with him on the way to Jerusalem. And we know that he's uh, on his way to Jerusalem for a specific purpose, and that is to be betrayed and then crucified. And so he's uh, on a mission, if you like. He's got a real sense of purpose. And I don't know whether you'd ever noticed, but in the Bible, in the Gospels particularly, when Jesus is talking, preaching, or, or performs a miracle, you can almost guarantee that every time there's a Pharisee hiding in the shadows. There's always somebody there watching, waiting, gathering evidence against him. Sounds quite sinister, doesn't it? You see, Jesus represented a real threat to the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So let's put this passage in its uh, context. Jesus has been talking and not has been um, giving a, a number of parables and a couple of weeks ago there was one about the parable of the tenants 
where the people in the vineyard they're given the responsibility of looking after the vineyard, tending and caring for it, and then then producing the profit and give them to the landowner. And uh, long story short, it turned out that Jesus was actually referring to the Pharisees, the religious leaders uh, of the time. And so you've been given the responsibility to look after Israel. You are responsible for the spiritual and moral welfare of the people, and you're not doing that. You're not doing your job properly. So naturally, the Pharisees are very, very, very astounded. They take it aback by this. How dare this Jesus talk about us like this? You see, they have a vested position. They were in cahoots with the Roman occupiers. They practiced the policy of live and let live. So long as we keep the Romans happy, they'll not interfere with what we're doing. And they were very, they had a lot of status. They had a lot of position in life. So Jesus comes along and is questioning their authority. He's questioning what they're really about. And he's actually pointing out that actually they're not doing the job they were called to, to do. So the, pas the passage begins when the Pharisees are obviously learning that the penny has finally dropped, that Jesus is actually criticizing, he's actually talking about them. Well, that just adds fuel to the fire. Because they've already got ideas that they don't like this man Jesus. And we're going to do everything we possibly can, not only to oppose him, but get rid of him. So this is, the, this is just like the final straw. And so you, you can imagine them all gathering together in, in the temple, all kind of hush whispers saying, well, what, what can we do about Jesus? What are we going to do? We must do something. We must say something. We must, we must find a way of catching him out. We must find a way of, of tracking him. So he makes this big mistake. And then he loses all his credibility, and the people won't follow him. Ah, oh, that sounds really good, doesn't it? That's an easy way of dealing with that. Let's put this plan into action. And so they sent their followers, their disciples. Now, you can imagine, hey, why didn't they go themselves? They probably didn't want to go because they didn't want more of the old uh, treatment from Jesus. And so they took the easy way out and sent their disciples, their followers, to confront Jesus. And to add strength to their numbers, they suggested that maybe a few people, what we call Herodians, went with them. And the Herodians were effectively like people who followed King Herod, Herod who was also in cahoots with the, with, the, um, with the Romans, but less so than the Pharisees. But these zealots, or Herodians as they're called, were like the Taliban. They were very religious, but they believed in using military force. And what their whole objective in life was, they were on a mission, and their mission was to free Israel from the Romans. And so the storm clouds are gathering. And so they come to Jesus, and they ask him this question. But it's interesting to note how they begin. They say to Jesus, they say this, Teacher, we know that you are sincere, and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Wow, how flattering. They're praising Jesus. They're softening him up for what's about to follow. I don't think they were very genuine when they said that. There's a hint of real sarcasm. Jesus, you're a good teacher. And we know you can do wonderful things, and you can just wait for the but. And the but is going to come in the form of a question. And they say this. It's a very important question. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Very simple question. But it's a very clever, cunning trick. They're trying to trap Jesus. Because you see, if he says you don't need to pay taxes, he's going to offend the Pharisees. And if he says, yes, you must pay taxes, he's going to offend the Herodians, the Zealots, the Taliban. Jesus is in a hopeless situation. He's trapped. It's a very clever question. And they think they've got him. They think this is it. We've got him. And he True to form, Jesus then turns the whole thing, the whole question, on its head. And he gives them a very powerful question. I was going to bring a 50p this morning, I, didn't, I forgot to do that, but 
He says, bring me a coin. Bring me something that you would use to pay taxes to the Roman authorities, yeah, and particularly to, to the emperor. Bring me a coin and, let, and tell me what's on it. Whose image, whose image is on the back of this coin? Now, in our coins, we know whose image it is. It's Queen Elizabeth II. And on this particular coin was the image of, I think it was Caesar. It was the image of the, um, the emperor. And those coins would have been forced upon the Jewish people by the Roman occupiers. There was no other way. It was the way the whole Roman Empire worked. And it made sense. It was a huge empire. Everybody uses the same currency, the same coins. So there's no confusion. There's no queuing up at the airport or, or the port to change your money with Thomas Cooks or whoever would change money. It's all there, consistent. So it makes sense. Jesus says, whose image is this on this coin? And they say, it's the emperor's. And he comes out with some, a profound saying. Jesus then says, well, first of all, he says, well, first of all, we're told, Jesus was aware of their malice. Malice, it's a strong word, it means a lot. It's not just anger, it's really driven anger. It's hatred, it's just ordinary common garden anger. It's real hatred. Jesus is aware of what's going on. He's wise to that because he's God, he's the son of God. So he knows their minds, knows their hearts, and he's ready. And he comes up with a fantastic answer. He says, why are you putting me to the test? Show me the coin. And they did that, and he said to them, whose head? Yes, we know that all, and they answered the emperor. And then he says, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. Wow, what does that mean? What does that actually mean? And as I said before, lots of sermons will probably stop there and say that's the example for us all to follow. We must pay our taxes. But as I said before, there's a deeper meaning. We need to tease it out a little bit. When coins were paid for taxes, it was like a tribute because they bared the emperor's image, like a tribute to the emperor. And I think that's fine, that's on one side when Jesus says, give to Caesar or render what unto Caesar, as the old um, Bible used to say, render unto Caesar those things that belong to Caesar, but give to God the things that belong to him. Now, there's an image on the coin, but how can we pay tribute with an image to God? Good question. Scratch your head for a moment. What is, what is he talking about? I think Jesus is talking about the image that we all bear. And we live in a very image conscious world. When I'm at the hairdressers, I love, it gives me great amusement and entertainment to read ladies' fashion magazines and men's fashion magazines, probably about three years old. But it's all about image. Have you ever been to a hairdresser and picked up a, a magazine and read it? And then think, oh, I like a hairdo like that. And you show it to the barber or the hairdresser and they say, oh, sorry, we can't do that, that's all false. We're all so conscious in this world of, of image and fashion and style. We're told that if you're going to succeed in life, you must have a good image. You must pr project yourself in such a way that impresses people. It's all about image. And the whole fashion industry, and I'm, I've done it too, I do it too. We think about our dress sense. You know, the number of times I've looked at myself in the mirror and thought, do you know, Calvin, you haven't got any dress sense at all. But I'm happy. I'm happy. But I know what it's like to feel I'm so image conscious. I worry about what people think about me. Our focus is on how we come across to other people. And we wear this pretense. We put on clothes that actually don't really fit, don't even match colour-wise. I could talk to you about matching colours and bright, bold colours till the, till the cows come home, because I love bright colours. But this isn't the kind of image that Jesus is talking about or suggesting. And the Bible has a lot to say about image. 
You might be surprised to hear that, but it does. And in the very first book of the Bible, in Genesis, Moses, who wrote it quite a while after the events of creation, he said that God created man, kind, and that means ladies as well, in his own image. Now think about it. Next time you see the beauty of the autumn colours, or some beautiful scenery, or something that you really enjoy and it's good in life, you can say, God created that. That tells me something about God. But in actual fact, the Bible also makes it very clear that we, as human beings, bear that special image. We are the pinnacle of creation. And Moses tells us that when God went through creating the earth, the sea, the birds, the animals, and everything else, we are always told, and God thought, said it was good. But when he made man, he said, God saw it as being very good. Not just ordinary good, but extra special good. And the reason is, because God created us in his image. Now I wonder if you looked in the mirror this morning, you probably didn't, I did because I know what was going to happen today, and thought, do I really bear God's image? Is there anything about God in me? In actual fact, there is. If you think about creation story, the Garden of Eden, everything was perfect. It was new, it was fresh. God met with people, the human beings that he created. He enjoyed friendship, fellowship with them. They, I love that time, that, that point when Moses talks about how God walked with, with Adam in the garden. Can you imagine, first thing in the morning with the early Jew, beautiful scenery, and walking along with God, and enjoying that. Actually just being with God. It was perfect. It sounds so far-fetched, it's hard to even begin to imagine what it was really like. Because we live in a very, very different world. Something went wrong. Something went wrong that made the world the way it is today. In the Garden of Eden there were no viruses. There was no illness. There was nothing. Just perfection. But something went wrong. I don't know whether you've recently bought a new refrigerator or a new car or a vacuum cleaner or something like that. It's all great when it works and when it's new. But in this day and age, how long are things going to last? Something goes wrong. And that's due to wear and tear and all that. And you know, it's not quite the same. It gives us an idea of how things went from very good to very bad in an instant. Because Adam and Eve sinned. They fell short of God's glory. And I know it's easy. I, I really would like to have a word of Adam and Eve sometimes because I get so frustrated with life. It's so hard. And it's actually all their fault. Well, it's my fault too. Because I bear something of Adam and me too. As we all do. The Bible makes it very clear. Theologians call it original sin. We are all sinners. Whether we like it or not, we're sinners because we are descendants from Adam. We bear his DNA. And that's a hard truth to acknowledge. And that means that we are separated from God. We are literally at war with God. We're in conflict with God. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate conflict. But can you imagine being at war in a conflict with God, the Creator, the Holy God? I don't think we'd stand a very good chance. We're human beings and we're weak. So we need help. We need help with this image. Because once Adam sinned, the whole world literally fell apart. It became corrupted. And God's image became marred. It became broken. It became like it, it, it almost wasn't there. And very soon after we hear about people being killed, we hear about natural disasters, all those sort of things that flow from that one moment when Adam and Eve sinned. The image was marred. The image needed help. We need help. Because we all descend from Adam. If I had about 36,000 years, 
I would probably be interested in trying to trace my ancestry all the way back to Adam. Can you imagine? Can you fancy that? How it could be related to who knows who? My brother has just done one of those DNA tests on, online. And you wouldn't believe the things and the people that are contacting him that have similar DNA to him. No, 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 no kind of relationship, no, no relation at all, nobody. But somehow there's that DNA that makes us, have, we have something in common. We're never going to be 100% alike, even in the same family. DNA will differ. But we have one thing in common, and that is we share Adam's DNA. And this sin is, we've fallen short of God's glory. And that's a terrible thought. And this part of us, I think, as we journey through life, we ask lots of questions. But to be in a life that's really tough, when life is painful, when we have to say goodbye to people, when we, when we know we're going to lose them, when we know grief is going to come upon us, we weren't made for that. And that's why I find it so hard, because it wasn't part of God's plan. It wasn't part of God's plan, so that's why we struggle. So we have questions. And I wonder if you were given the chance to ask God maybe three questions. I wonder what they would be. Let me tell you what mine would be. My first question is, why? Why did all this happen? Surely there must have been an easier way. Surely you could have just made it possible for Adam and Eve to resist the temptation. And the other question, the second question is uh, very different. It is, what's the point? What is the point of living? Because life is really short and it's very fragile. What is the point? Why bother? And I guess maybe if you're like me, you've gone through times when you just feel like giving up. You just feel that life just has no meaning, no purpose, and what's the point? I've been through so much tough stuff recently and I don't see the point in carrying on because I don't see it getting any better. And the reality is the world is not going to get any better. We like to think maybe in a few years it will get sorted, all our social problems, all the evil in the world will be sorted and we'll be able to live in a good place. I'm going to stick my neck out here when I say I don't think it's ever going to get any better. I think it can only get worse. So we need to know, well, what's the point of it all? What is the point? Because it's not going to get any better, it's just going to be more heartache. I reached the point not so long ago when I said I don't think I ever want to be loved by another person because it's too painful to have to say goodbye. And that's got to happen. And it's painful. And I ask myself, what's the point? And the third question is something like this. Who am I? Who am I? What's my purpose and my point in life? Sorry, it's three sub-questions. What is my point? What is my purpose? And who am I? I know you can say, well, <laughs> you know who you are, you're Calvin. Of course I am. But deep down inside, who am I? Who am I really? And I wonder how many people can honestly say to themselves today, now, at this moment, saying, I know who I am. I know myself and I know who I am. And I'd say, that's really good. But I'd also say, how old are you? And you might say, I'm 80, I'm 90, whatever. And I'd say, keep going, keep learning. Because life is a learning experience. And life's experiences teach us. And we come out stronger and stronger and wiser and wiser. And if we're walking with the Lord Jesus as our friend and saviour, we have those help, we have the resources to carry on. Now, what's all it's got to do with image? Well, image is how we project ourselves. And that image that God gave us, is, is, it's, not, it's not good. We do lots of fantastic things in the world. I remember when I was growing up, this is well before I joined the Air Force, but this is part of the reason why I did join. And I used to love watching aeroplanes. I would go, if I was going away on holiday anyway, I would insist that we went at least three or four hours early 
So I had to go around looking at all these airplanes and taking photographs with my old little Instamatic camera. I had, a, I had a real blast in those days. I loved aviation, I loved airplanes. And even if I just get a little clip on the news or on TV on an airplane, I'm just like, wow, look at that. And it used to fascinate me how you see these big jumbos and these big aircraft made by men, able to run along the runway, take off and fly safely to the other side of the world. And I remember one time when I was at Heathrow Airport and there was a plane that had come from North America, I forget exactly where. But I remember at the same time, that, that time, that particular time of the year, in that location in America, North America, they were having bad storms, and they were having bad ice and all sorts of snow, and that was terrible. And there we are, this plane comes all the way, across the Atlantic safely. Man's invention. Think of all the science, the, the, the developments in science. Think about medicine, all the way, all the things that have that developed and progressed through man thinking and creating and working things out. That's part of God's image in operation because God is a creator God. And so we bear something of that image in us. Some of the way, some of the times our creativity is not used for good. But we won't go into the internet because I think we all know about that. But that's a fundamentally a good thing. But it's been abused. It's been it's just become something that it was probably never intended to be. And that illustrates the point that there's something good in all of us, but there's also something evil, there's bad in each one of us. And if I asked you to put up your hand and say, okay, who's bad? I'm not sure, and I, have, I would really struggle with that. I'm not sure I really want to put my hand up. Because we don't like to acknowledge that we're bad. But we still bear something of God's image. But we're still not there yet in the sense of being made right, having what was lost in the Garden of Eden. The book of James is a, it's a good book. James talks about lots of life in the church, and he particularly talks about people who uh, don't have what he calls controlled tongues. And we all know that words have power. They can be very positive to encourage one another, they can also be very negative. And whoever says, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me, I don't think they were living on this planet. There certainly must have been some superhuman being, because the words that he hears sometimes can be very destructive. So James says a lot about using words, and he talks about what he calls the unbridled tongue. But he also says this, it's a very subtle clue, and it gives us a hint of the kind of image of God that we bear today. We do still have something of that image. James says you must be careful how you use your tongue, because we are effectively hypocrites. We use words and our tongues to praise God, and yet at the same time, we're being critical and negative about other people. We're gossiping about them behind their back. Hey, let's face it, we all enjoy a good gossip. I think it's because it actually makes us feel good about ourselves. We realise, actually, I'm not that bad because Mrs. So-and-so down the road is doing X, Y, Z. And so, you've got to think. And then James, James carries on and says, you're doing that, and when you're doing that, you're being negative about people with your words. You're, you're praising God, but you're also slandering those who bear God's image which suggests that we still have what's left of God's image in each one of us. And as I said, there's a potential for good and evil in each one of us. So we've got to work out what's the problem, what, how can we resolve this? How can we actually solve this problem of our image? Well, it's not easy. But that's because we try and do it ourselves. And we do lots of nice things. We're nice to our neighbours. Particularly when we think they're going to be nice back to us. We're loving, we're kind, we give money to charity. All very commendable things. I give money to church. Very commendable. We, we need it. What about, I come to church every Sunday. I come to church every Sunday. And then the rest of the week, well, 
if I can remember, I'll say my prayers, but I don't read my Bible. And, and actually, but I believe that if I'm good, and if I pay my insurance premiums, that is, come to church every Sunday, God might just let me into heaven. I might just scrape in. My grandfather came out to visit our family. Uh, in those days, I was living in Rhodesia, as it's now called Zimbabwe. And uh, sadly, he fell ill when he was out there. He came over from Northern Ireland. And he was not a Christian. He believed something, but he never actually put his faith and trust in Jesus as a Savior. And we prayed and we prayed and we prayed for him, but he just didn't seem to want to, the penny just didn't seem to drop. And so the church minister went to see him. And he got talking about life and death and what happens after you die. And my granddad said, I think I might scrape in. <coughs> and the minister, quite rightly, very kindly and gently said to him, he's called Arthur, terrible name, I bear it as well, I bear his image. And he said, Arthur, you don't have to just scrape in. You can walk in triumphantly. Your image of God can be restored now, before you pass away. And you will walk in as a victor. You will walk in and you will be welcomed home. You don't need to worry about just scraping in and then just hiding in the background. You can go and you can join in. And fortunately, I'm really pleased to say, he did commit his life. Literally a matter of just a few hours before he sadly passed away. But he knew that once the penny dropped, we can all know that restoration of God's image in us. If we try and do it ourselves, and I've got some really bad news for, for you today, and I apply it to myself as well. The bad news is that if we try and earn God's favour, get into heaven, he actually calls it, he describes them in, I think it's the book of Isaiah, he calls them filthy rags in God's eyes. That's a tough thing to bear. That's a tough thing to think. I've spent a whole lifetime trying to earn God's favour. And all he sees is filthy rags. What a waste. So where's the good news going to come? Well, I've got some really good news for you. Jesus came not only to be our saviour, not only to be our friend, and we'll talk about that in a, in a few moments, but he came to show us what God is like. And I'm sure you've all used the expression, it's a bit of a loaded term nowadays, you look at a family, you look at the son or the daughter and you say, gosh, they're the spitting image of your dad. I'm sure we've all seen it, maybe it's been described to us and our children, the spitting image. I don't like using the word spitting, the phrase spitting image for obvious reasons, it's taking on a completely different meaning now, it's become really political. You know, we'll all remember the program, comedy program, spitting image. The spitting image of your dad. Hey, boy, that daughter of yours just looks so much like you. And as she's sitting family, if you saw a photograph from my older brother, who's nearly nine years older than me, we actually look like twins. I think he's aging very well, or Eli, I'm growing old too quickly. But the point is, we bear something that makes us think they're related. They're actually related. And sometimes you might think, well, I don't really want to look like my parents. Um, but that's just the way it is. And so Paul tells us in the book of Colossians that Jesus is the exact representation of what God is like. He's come to show us the image of God. If you want to know really what God is like, we need to understand and get to know what Jesus is like. See, there's, there's a whole point and purpose of God's plan. He's a holy God. And if he came as a holy God to this earth, well, I don't think there'd be anything left because he's a holy God. And nobody, nobody can stand in his presence as human beings without, and I'm going to tell you why in a moment, nobody can stand in, and it would just be chaos. It would just be, that's a devastation, destruction. And so God very wisely, very sensibly sent Jesus, his son, in human form become like us, to bear God's image to us. Right, now think back to Adam. Adam was the pinnacle of creation. Adam and Eve, sorry ladies. 
Adam was the pinnacle of God's creation. And his role was to bear God's image to the whole of creation. Now, we are also called as Christians to bear God's image to the rest of the world in which we live, to the society in which we live, our friends, our families, and also our workplace. It's a tough ask, but let's just deal with that in a minute. I'll do a lot of things in a minute. But the point is, Jesus came to be the image bearer, to show us, to show us what it's like, to what it's like to bear God's image. I wonder if you'd ever looked in the mirror and think, I look a bit like Jesus. But that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be like Jesus. And it's impossible. We can't do it. I've tried. I couldn't begin to tell you the amount of effort and energy I've invested in being the good Christian, the person like Jesus that everybody would like and admire. Because I know I'm a human being and I've failed. So we all need help. And that help begins in Jerusalem. On Easter day, Jesus died on the cross to give us new life, to give us a new image, to restore everything that was lost in the Garden of Eden back into its rightful place, back to perfection. Now you might say, well, hang on a minute. I don't live in a perfect world. No, we don't. But this is God working out his plans and his purposes to say, this is the beginning. It starts with you and I. Bear my witness. Be my witness. Be my image bearer to the world. And we talked, it's quite convenient actually, because we talked a little while ago about clothes. And Paul talks about if we're going to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we need to put him on like new clothes, effectively. We bear the image of Jesus and of God to the world in which we live. But as I said, the first stage is to come to God and say, I'm a sinner. I want to find the answer to all my unanswered questions. But I know that you, can, you will forgive me. Please help me to understand and to then move on and to grow to become an image bearer. It's a huge responsibility. But it comes with a great deal of privilege to know that we belong and that we do have a purpose and a point in life that actually it's not a waste of time. We're going to a far better place. Can you imagine? Can you imagine going to heaven, standing in God's presence and joining in? No viruses, no tears, no goodbyes, no pain. Just sheer delight of standing in God's presence with hundreds and thousands of other people and hearing that choir of angels singing forever. And everything that God promised in his Bible, in his word, will come true. We'll understand why life has been so difficult. And we'll also find answers to our questions. Now you might think, well, that's, that's easier said than done. But it's not. Because we have help. We have the example of Jesus, but we also have the Holy Spirit that leads and guides us and transforms our image. So that the image that we project is not only genuine and authentic, but it's real. And it's the way God intended us to function and to be. Think back to Adam. Think what was lost. But also think about yourself. And what could be gained? What it would be like? God gives us a choice. He says, if you want to be in heaven, to be my people, to be with me for eternity, then you have to put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Saviour. Let him work in you and restore my image in you. Effectively, the Holy Spirit is Jesus living inside us. And I think it's a lovely picture to say, we don't have to stress about putting forward an image. We don't have to worry about that sort of thing. We just need to work with God and enable Him to transform us. Right back to the beginning. So when Jesus says, give to the emperor, give to Caesar what is owed him, 
his tribute, his image. But at the same time, give to God what is God's. And that is his image in us. Jesus is saying in a very subtle way, but I think in a very powerful way, he's saying, you need to give your image, what you have in your life to me, to God, so that he can transform your image, so that we become image bearers. I'm sorry, but I'm sure we've seriously gone over time, but I do apologise. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for sending your Son Jesus to be our friend, to be our Saviour, to bear your image to us. Pray that you'll forgive us for the times when we don't want to bear that image. We would rather do it ourselves. We pray that you would help us to have the courage and uh, the willingness to uh, let you come into our lives as our friend, as our Saviour, and also to transform us through your Spirit so that we could, as, as people, as individuals, but also as a church, become image bearers, the image of you, reflecting something of your glory to the world around us. We pray this in your name. Amen. So let's now stand to affirm our faith in the words of the creed. And so together we say, We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, and was incarnate from the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified, he has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So do please be seated for our intercession. I would like this morning, as the difficulties in the world caused by COVID-19 continue um, unabated, to begin our intercessions with the prayer that's been used throughout the diocese during the pandemic. So let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we trust in your promise to hear us when we pray in faith. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy in this time of great uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support and strengthen the anxious and the fearful, and lift up all who are brought low, that we may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Strengthen us, Lord, in the certain knowledge of your constant presence so that we witness to your love by the way we speak and act each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of love, we pray for the life of your church throughout the world, especially where persecution persists and people are punished for their faith. We pray for all those who preach the gospel. Help those who try to put it towards the message of hope a new life to be found in Jesus Christ. Give them the help of your Holy Spirit, that their words may go straight to the hearts and minds and wills of those who hear. 
May every congregation be a community of love and every Christian a witness to your grace as were the early disciples. Strengthen us here at St Paul's to face the challenges which lie ahead and make us a living fellowship as we seek to serve our neighbourhood. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Father, we pray for peace in our world, for all national leaders, that they may have the wisdom to know and the courage to do what is right. May your spirit of forgiveness and justice permeate the social and political fabric of our world to enable those with authority to rule wisely, discuss differences calmly and be prepared to negotiate rationally. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, alert us to the needs of those around us. Increase our friendliness and understanding in all our relationships. We pray for the vulnerable and the lonely, for those tormented by guilt and those who despair. Give them the comfort of knowing you are with them and draw them to the light of your forgiveness. We pray especially for the resentful and all who suffer injustice or neglect, for all in need from natural disasters, war, famine or disease. May your love reach them through our care. Bring your health and wholeness to those in physical pain and mental anguish and give your inner peace to those overwhelmed with worries. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Welcome into your kingdom, Father, all your children who have died, especially those we have loved and named in our hearts. May we one day share the joy and peace of coming home to you forever. Merciful Father, I accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much. Can I invite you all now please to stand? God's word uh, tells us very clearly that uh, God has made us one in Christ. He has set his seed upon us by his spirit, the seal uh, upon us by his spirit, as a pledge of what is about to come. He has given us his peace and his spirit to teach us and lead us in our hearts. And so, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. So let's uh, share peace with one another. You might want to just do a special blow on your mask or something, just make it noise. And so we begin this part of our service and we come to celebrate communion and be reminded of God's love uh, for us and the sacrifice that uh, Jesus uh, paid for us as uh, his image bearer. And so remember that the Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You give your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising has set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels, praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Holy Lord, God of our God, Christ, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the heights. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit the broken bread and wine out for it be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, 
and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you and gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Father, we remember all that Jesus did, and in him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life and the cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. And so we can't help but say, Praise to you, Lord Jesus. And so, Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven, through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And so let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. The body of Christ keep you eternal life. The body of Christ keep you eternal life.
body of Christ keeps in the town. The body of Christ keeps you in the town. I do apologise for running over time. If you get in trouble, get at home and the dinner's burnt or anything, just uh, wait and go to Kentucky Fried Chicken or something. <laughs> um, but you can blame me. And uh, I think next time I'll probably ask for somebody to have a red flag to wait to tell me I'm going over time. So I do apologise. Well, once again, talking about things that I feel really passionate about, I, I can't stop myself. So uh, thank you for your patience. And maybe if you see that I'm on the, on the road the next time, you might think, well, I'll, I'll have the day off then. <laughs> I wouldn't blame you. <laughs> anyway, it's been lovely to see you, and I hope you have a really good day. Enjoy the rest of the day and the weekend. And uh, are we on half term yet? No. No? One more week. One more week. <laughs> Counting the days. Well, you never know. It could be longer than a week. You never know. But anyway, stay well and stay safe. And so, may the God who calls us to follow him and to bear his image to the world strengthen us and enable us to fulfill this calling. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and those whom you love and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. And uh, do we need to say or do you want to go first? No? You can go first. I'll, I'll say what I need to say next. Uh,
Uh, can we all of us just thank Calvin very much for joining us and leaving our service this morning? Thank you. If you want to say thank you, thank the Lord. Thank God. Because I'm a human being just like the rest of you. And uh, I'm just very blessed. So it's, a bless it's a blessing for me to come and share. So thank you. Thank you. Um, very, very quickly, there are still opportunities for your harvest gifts. And we've still got a few plants. So if you have someone that you can think of who might like to receive one from the church, then please just take one from the back of the church. And again, we've got wonderful gifts of <coughs> cooking apples. So again, if you still, if you've eaten up all your cooking apples, there are some on the pew at the back. So please, I'd just like to leave a small donation for the Bishop's Harvest Appeal. Um, items for the November magazine, please. If you could let Wendy have them as soon as possible. There are still some copies of the October magazine, so please do take one. Uh, and also on the notice board at the back, we did have our APCM last week and we've got a list of the members of the PCC and um, Andrew and Terry are going to continue as our church wardens and for that we're very grateful indeed uh, and Heather has become our um, church secretary so we thank her for that too. Can um, I just interrupt? I think we should give Terry and the rest of the PCC and the wardens and everybody <coughs> works really hard to keep this church going. Let's, now that is a deserved uh, round of applause so well done. <laughs> And next Sunday, Kevin will be leading us, and we shall have um, our Holy Communion, um, as we usually do on the fourth Sunday. So thank you very much. And you'll probably get home on time as well. <laughs> So, uh, I don't know about you, but wearing all these masks, I feel like my ears are turning inwards. And I think there's going to be a generation where all of a sudden we're morphed and we're all going to have ears like that rather than <laughs> just normal ears. Right, so what are we going to do now? We're going to go uh, in peace. peace to do what? To love us. And in whose name we're we going? In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you again and have a great afternoon. Thank mm -hmm. you.